When light encounters an interface between two media, it's not only possible for reflection to occur, but as we have seen, refraction. That is, light can penetrate into the next material, but this traversing from one material to another has consequences that are dictated by Snell's law. Let's look at situations where various shapes of boundaries are placed in the path of light, allowing light to enter the next material, but refracting in such a way that respects the orientation of the boundary interface between the two media. This is the study of lenses, lens material, and a special case of these general interfaces, thin lenses. In this lecture, I'm going to cover thin lenses and the human eye. To begin the discussion of thin lenses, we have to look back at the law of refraction, and uh, also known as Snell's law, and the way in which light moves from one material into another. So to refresh here, we could imagine that we have a situation where we have uh, one material, like air, over on uh, one part of our picture. And then there's a boundary between air and another material. So for instance, we can imagine that we have here some glass. Now what distinguishes air from glass for the purpose of optics is the index of refraction of the new, these two materials. So we have uh, N1, uh, which is the index of refraction of air. And that is pretty much very close to 1.000, so we'll just write that as 1.0. And we have N2, which is the index of refraction for glass, and that varies depending on the type of glass, but we can imagine that we have an index of refraction of about 1.6 for the glass in this example here. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to send in a ray of light, and that ray of light is going to originate in the air and it's going to strike the surface of the glass. Some of it will reflect, but I'm interested in the part of the light that is going to refract, that is pass through the interface between the air and the glass and then travel inside of the glass. So for instance, I might imagine sending an array uh, at an angle like this, and we know that we then have to consider the relationship between that light ray and the uh, normal to the surface of the glass where it strikes. So for instance, I've drawn a nice red dot here to indicate where the ray strikes the glass, and I can just put a little dotted line through here that represents the normal to the surface. So this, uh, right here at this point, where I've uh, drawn the ray striking the glass, makes an angle of 90 degrees with the surface of the glass. Now we can write the angle in the air part of the problem as theta 1. That's the angle between the ray and the normal to the surface where the, the uh, refraction is going to occur. And the ray is going to exit, and it's going to exit at a different angle. The light ray will bend. We know from the discussion of Snell's law the light ray will bend because the speed of light inside of glass is different than the speed of light inside of air, and this causes the wavelength of the light to shift slightly. Uh, and the net effect of this is that the trajectory of the light ray changes when it goes from air to glass, or if it were to go from glass to air, that would also happen. So we have some, uh, some different angle here, and we have the refracted ray. So here is our refracted ray, and it's going to make an angle with respect to the normal of theta 2 inside of the glass, and Snell's law allows us to relate the two. So Snell's law is simply n1 times the sine of theta 1 must be equal to n2 times the sine of theta 2. Now we can rearrange this equation to write the ratio of the signs in terms of the ratio of the indices of refraction. So let's go ahead and do that. What I'd like to do is I'd like to get the ratio of sine theta 1 to sine theta 2 in terms of the ratio of the index of refraction of the glass over that of the air. So with a simple rearrangement I can go ahead and do this. I can say sine theta 1 divided by 
sine theta 2 is just equal to n2 over n1. And because of the indices of refraction that I've picked for this example, this ratio is just 1.6 because it's 1.6 divided by 1. This then allows us to look at the ratio of the sines. We see that the ratio of the sines of the two angles is going to be 1.6. Now the sine of a small angle is a small number. And the sine of a larger angle as you approach 90 degrees, for instance, is a larger number. So what this tells us is that the sine of theta 1 divided by the sine of theta 2 is a number greater than 1. And that implies that the angle, theta 1, is greater than theta 2, because the sine of theta 1, the sine of theta 1 is greater than the sine of theta 2, according to this equation. And that implies, and if you're not sure about this, go and play around with the sine for a little bit. This implies that theta 1 is greater than theta 2, which is exactly what I've drawn in this picture. So in this refraction, we have that this angle, theta 1, is a larger angle than this angle, theta 2, because we're going from a material with a low index of refraction into a material with a higher index of refraction. And in general, this will always be true. If you go from a material with a low index of refraction and you pass into a material with a high index of refraction relative to the original uh, medium in which the light was propagating, you will reduce the angle with respect to the normal that the light ray is making. Now let's take the principle that we've just looked at with refraction, where you go from a medium with a low index of refraction to a high index of refraction, and let's apply this to what's known as a lens. A lens is nothing more than a system of materials designed to change the path that light takes. So light will enter the material at one angle, and it will exit the material on the other side at a different angle and by adjusting the properties of the material one can cause the light to follow uh, very well-defined predefined paths that allow you to focus light to a point or defocus light away from a point and by doing all of this we can build up optical transportation systems so let me sketch uh, a, a lens I'm going to make the lens slightly rounded on one side just a little bit and then I'm going to have just a really thick bit of material in here. And then I'm going to have that same slightly rounded face on the other side. So these slightly rounded faces, for the purposes of this course, I'm going to keep a nice simple shape. I'm going to make them semicircular. That is, these are part of some very large circle. with radius, for instance, uh, for the right-hand side, R2. And then similarly over here, you can imagine that this face is part of some other large circle with radius R1. So the radii of curvature of the two sides of this glass system, let's just call this glass, some index of refraction N2, uh, these are, are semicircular faces of glass uh, that you can imagine having been cut from a very large sphere of glass with very large radii, R1 and R2. Now, just like in the mirror case, I'm going to define the optical axis to be a line that passes dead center through the lens. So let's label this the optical axis. The optical axis is a convenient reference point for images and objects and focal points and focal lengths and all that stuff that we used for mirrors, and we're going to repeat that now for not for reflection, but re for refraction. Now, the whole purpose of this is to show you what the transportation of light looks like through this system. So let me send an array that comes in parallel to the optical axis. So here's my incident ray and it's parallel to the optical axis, which is this black dotted line here. Now, it's going to refract when it strikes the air-glass interface. So let's write this N1, and we can call this air. We've already handled that situation before. That's an index of refraction of about 1. The glass is an index of refraction of something like 1.6. It's a bigger index of refraction, so we know that once we draw the normal 
to the interface between the air and the glass, whatever the angle is between the incident ray in air and the normal, it will be a smaller angle inside the glass. So the normal to the surface of a uh, circular interface is going to lie along a radial line of the circle from which the glass is cut. So this is a very large radius uh, circle. So we might imagine that the normal looks something like this. It doesn't have, it makes a, an angle with respect to the optical axis that is not zero, but it's very slight as we can see here. And we know that the refracted ray is going to come out at a very slight angle to the normal inside of the glass. Let me exaggerate that by having it lie almost on top of that normal. See it has a slight divergence there. There's my ray and there's my refracted ray. So we have an incident ray making a angle theta 1 with respect to the normal and we have the outgoing ray inside the glass making an angle theta 2 that's a lot smaller than the angle between the uh, incident ray and the normal on the outside. That ray is going to continue to travel inside of the glass and it's going to strike the glass on the other side where it meets the air. And we have to just repeat the refractive process again. We have to draw a normal to the surface of the air glass interface and our refracted ray will make a larger angle outside of the glass than it did inside of the glass because now we're going from a large index of refraction material to a lower index of refraction material. And there we go. So we'll call this angle theta 4 and this angle theta 3. So the relationships that we expect between all these angles is that theta 2 is less than theta 1 and theta 3 is less than theta 4. So this is the basic principle by which any kind of lens works. Parallel rays coming in from the left will refract at the first boundary. They will bend inside the material as a result of that refraction they will experience a second refraction over on the other face of the material and then they will bend even further. And in this particular configuration this results in a parallel ray being bent toward the optical axis on the other side of the material. And this is known as a converging or focusing lens. It takes light that comes in parallel and it bends it down toward the optical axis on the other side. You could imagine that another ray that enters down here at the bottom following a similar uh, set of arguments. So here's our normal. We get a refraction that results in a smaller angle on this side. And then we have a second refraction here. Okay, And we get some refracted ray on the other side. We see that a ray that enters the bottom of the lens on the left side will be bent up toward the optical axis on the right an array that enters at the top on the left side will be bent down toward the optical axis on the right and you can see why this gets its name uh, as being a focusing lens. Now I didn't do a great job of drawing this if I drawn this as a perfectly smooth circle and got my normals exactly right then of course these uh, these rays should have converged maybe right on the optical axis but you get the idea. Uh, this is an example of a converging lens and here you have convex glass faces on both sides and the effect of those convex glass faces is to cause uh, light rays to bend toward the optical axis if they came in parallel on the left side of the setup. That was an example of a converging lens system but we can also imagine a diverging lens system. Here instead of having a convex glass face we just have to make a slight concave glass face on one side lots of material and then a similarly slight convex face on the other. I will draw my optical axis and then I will send in a light ray up here parallel to the optical axis. Now in this case the circular face bends away from the light ray so the radial line that points back toward the center of the circle points back this way unlike in the case of the converging face where it sort of tilted down here it tilts up 
we get a uh, slightly smaller angle with respect to the face. We get a second refraction over here. And this ray will bend away. Sending in a light ray down here. Again, we draw our normal to the surface. We have a slight angle here. And we have uh, the normal that way. And we get an even more pronounced angle out of the other side of the interface. This is what is known as a diverging lens. And you can see why. It causes parallel rays from the left to pass through the glass, diverging away from the optical axis on the right. And here, whereas the focal point was on the right-hand side of the lens before, here if we extend our rays back to where we think they came from on the other side, we see that they converge actually on the side of the lens where the light originated. And this is a very handy point to define a real and virtual images for lens systems. So let's go back to the concept of images again. A real image, just like in a mirror, a real image for a lens system is located in a place where it physically could in fact be observed with a screen. You could put a screen in that location and you could actually see the image of the light uh, from the object on the other side of the lens. Real images form on the side of the lens opposite the object. That is, if I have light from an object starting out over on the left side, I expect for a real image for a lens system that the focused light, the focal point for the, the refracted light will lie on the other side of the lens, so on the right hand side of the lens. A virtual image, on the other hand, it lies on the same side as the object. And you can see already that a converging lens forms uh, has the potential to form a real image on the opposite side of the lens, and a diverging lens forms a virtual image on the same side of the uh, lens where the object is actually located. If you tried to put a screen there, you would, of course, block the incident light from the object and you wouldn't be able to form the image on the screen. Nonetheless, diverging lenses are extremely important in optical systems and you need both converging and diverging lenses in order to transport light uh, for all kinds of applications like medical imaging and, and uh, you know, non-invasive, uh, well, invasive but non-surgical uh, imaging techniques like uh, um, uh, endoscopy. Now before moving on to a demonstration of lensing systems, uh, what I would like to do is I would like to discuss thin lenses, which are the things we're actually going to use for the rest of the class. So I've been showing you essentially thick lenses to motivate the refraction process, but we can instead switch to a related class of lenses known as thin lenses. And these are lenses whose uh, thickness is much smaller than the uh, distance of the object from the lens. That's it. So if you imagine having an object, like a person, standing on the optical axis of a lens, and we were to put a thick lens, you know, far enough away from them so that the thickness didn't really show, we could imagine that a converging lens could be represented simply as two semicircular faces uh, glued together with very little material in between them. Or uh, similarly, we could imagine a diverging lens. Again, here's the person. A diverging lens simply being represented as two uh, semicircular faces, but concave rather than convex. So here we have converging, and here we have diverging. 
And it's actually much easier to represent these lenses using a simple symbol and uh, a typical convention for converging thin lenses is to simply draw them like this. And for diverging thin lenses is to simply draw them like this. So this just represents a thin lens, a lens whose thickness is far smaller than the distance of the object, uh, the distances involved, for instance, of the object to the lens system. And so you can use a, a line with two arrowheads uh, for converging and a line with two reversed arrowheads for uh, diverging. And the idea here is that any light ray that enters will be bent. Converging lens will bend the light toward the optical axis. Diverging lenses will bend the light away from the optical axis. Okay, So you can very quickly sketch these pictures and draw some light rays and you'll be good to go. Now, just as in mirror systems, it's very convenient to analyze lens systems and the way that light moves through them using this uh, concept of principal rays. So for instance, if I imagine that I have an object over here, some distance p away from the lens system. So this is my object. I'm just going to use a, a simple upright arrow to represent that object in this case. You can use principal rays to, uh, to analyze the transport of light through the system. Uh, so for example, if you have a lens that has a, a focal point given by f, uh, that point might be located over here. And because lenses, for instance, are symmetric, it's the same distance on either side. So light entering from the left can pass through the focal point uh, on the right, and light entering from the right could pass through the focal point on the left. Lenses are typically some kind of symmetric uh, or semi-symmetric system, and so the focal point of a lens applies equally on either side uh, of the lens. This is distinct from a mirror because light can't penetrate a mirror. The focal point lies on either one side or the other of a mirror, but for a lens it can be on either side. Now, the principal rays that we will use to look at the transport of light through a thin lens system, uh, one will just use parallel rays. That's one of the rays we looked at with mirrors, and we'll look at it again with thin lenses. A parallel ray comes in parallel to the optical axis. So if I imagine a ray coming from this point here, and I draw it, coming in parallel to the optical axis, these light rays will be bent through the focal point of the lens. So here is my parallel ray. Now another kind of principal ray is a central ray. This is a ray that passes dead center through the optical axis of the lens. So in this case, that would be a ray that starts out at this point, passes through the dead center of the lens, and actually passes through undiverted. That's a central ray. So any ray that passes through the dead center of the, of the lens, right through its optical center, will essentially look like it's undiverted, and it will continue on its way on the other side of the thin lens system. Now, of course, you can also have rays that go through the focus the focal point. So we will have focal rays. We can look at that as a principal ray. That's another ray that you are uh, free to, to draw. That's a ray that passes through the focal point of the lens on the object side and then comes out parallel to the optical axis on the other side. So this one is a focal ray. Now I didn't do a great job of trying to draw the focal point as symmetric on either side, but basically where these rays converge over here represents the location on the image that is equal to the location that I started with on the object. And so I would here draw my image over here and we see that it's inverted. So this is a converging lens. And we see that when we have the object to the left of the focal point of the converging lens, we wind up with an image that is real and inverted. Now we can continue to analyze lens systems using these principal rays. 
And to do that, what I'd like to do is not keep drawing these by hand. I'd rather have a computer do all this stuff for me so that my pictures are prettier and more accurate. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch now from this hand drawing nonsense to using a simulation of optical effects uh, that is provided by the uh, University of Colorado's FET demonstration system. So this is the optics lab uh, demonstration system provided by the FET uh, simulation suite. You can see here that we have a, a very nice uh, system. Uh, we have an object over here that we can move. And I've elected to have the simulation show principal rays. Right? So here you see the focal ray passing through the focal point marked with an X of this converging lens. It comes out parallel to the optical axis on the other side. We see the central ray passing through the optical center of the lens undiverted and then coming through the other side. And we see a parallel ray coming in and then being bent through the focal point on the right hand side of the converging lens. And they all meet up over here. You see when a computer does this, it looks a whole lot prettier than when I do. I've actually set the refractive index of this lens to be 1.6. And you'll notice it has a uh, certain diameter. Uh, so that just changes basically the, this uh, height of the lens. So that just changes the diameter of the lens itself. And you can affect the radius of curvature of the glass. And you can alter the curvature in such a way that you also alter the optical properties of the lens itself. So I'm going to leave that at 0.8 meters for the curvature radius. Uh, that basically means that this glass has a rounded surface that um, is as if it were cut from a big sphere of glass whose radius is about 0.8 meters. Now you'll see that I have it uh, set up to show virtual images when those occur. Uh, we haven't gotten to that quite yet, but we will get to that in a moment. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change our little object here so we have something a little more akin to what we've been using, an arrow. And I'm going to put that arrow pretty firmly right on the optical axis. So I've now laid that arrow right out on the optical axis. And you see here that my little sketch that I did a moment ago for a converging lens, when the object is located to the left of the focal point, that's not too bad. I actually got that pretty good considering how crummy my drawing was. You see that the resulting image is, in fact, inverted uh, on the other side, and it's real. It's on the opposite side of the lens from the object, which is on the left. The image is on the right. Now, let's see what happens as I move my arrow, my object, closer and closer to the focal point. We see that what's happening is that as I move my arrow closer to the focal point, the rays are having to diverge away from one another, and never mind this, this is just an effect here to, uh, to show you how the ray would bend if it passed through the, the, uh, the lens on that end. It's getting bigger. The image is getting larger on the right-hand side. It's still inverted, but it's a much larger image. And so you can kind of see that if you want to enlarge an image of something, if you, want, if you have an object like writing on a piece of paper over here, and your eye is over here on the right, and you want the writing on the paper to be bigger, you want to move the paper closer and closer and closer to the focal point of the lens system. Now, let's see if I can rein this in a little bit. So I'm going to uh, make this a big refractive index here. Let's take it up to like 1.8, just so we can see everything still on the, the screen here. All right. I'm going to continue to move my object closer and closer to the focal point. And right at the focal point, we get into an interesting situation. At the focal point, all the rays coming out the other side are parallel. That is, they don't focus anywhere on the right-hand side. When you stick an object right at the focal point of a converging lens, you can't form an image on the other side. We'll see this reflected in a bit when we look at the lens equation, the thin lens equation, which is very similar to the mirror equation. Now as I move my object inside the focal point, we see that now the rays do converge, but they don't converge on the right-hand side of the lens. Rather, they point back to a, 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 a focal point on the left-hand side of the lens. So now we're making a virtual image. There is no way I could put a, a, a screen uh, over here and get this image to, to form. All right, so what's kind of neat about this is that this is essentially the operating principle 
of a magnifying glass. So a magnifying glass uses curved surfaces of glass. You can hold it in your hand and uh, the, the surface of the glass is curved such that the focal point is very far away from the center, central point in the lens. If you lay the, the, the uh, magnifying glass over a piece of paper, you will see on the other side of the, of the glass a uh, large, an enlarged, upright image of the um, writing, for instance, that you're attempting to magnify. So this is a magnifying glass that I've just created here. So if, I, if my eye is over here on the right-hand side, I will appear to see the rays from the object converging at a point behind the object, but enlarged and upright. And that's exactly what we want from a magnifying glass. We don't want a magnifying glass to invert text and enlarge it, then we can't read it. We want it instead to have the text be upright. And that's why we have to put our eyeballs over here and we can see the light rays that are refracted they appear to come from an object that's behind where the actual object is located, much bigger and upright. So this is the operating principle of a magnifying glass. You put your object inside the focal length of the magnifying glass lens, and you put your eye on the other side, and the rays that come out all appear to come from a point back here behind the lens. This is a virtual image. But this is how you observe that virtual image. You put your eye over here and you'll see the rays as if they appear to converge back behind the lens where the paper is located. So that's how you get a virtual image. So this very nicely demonstrates how you can use a lens and an object to create different kinds of images. You can create a real, inverted, reduced image if you move your object far from the focal point. If you move your object closer to the focal point, you can get a real uh, enlarged and inverted image. And if you move your object within the focal point, you can get a virtual enlarged upright image uh, that winds up being on the same side as the object itself. And that's the basics of how a converging lens will work. A diverging lens will only ever form a virtual image that lies on the same side of the uh, lens as the object. So uh, that's one of the kind of neat things about a diverging lens. Uh, the converging lens has a much more rich set of structures, a uh, much more rich set of outcomes that can occur, and that's why I demonstrated here. But a diverging lens is also useful, but it always forms a virtual image uh, on the same side as the, the object itself. Now the workhorse of thin lenses is uh, an equation known as the thin lens equation and it won't look too surprising to you. It's uh, simply that 1 over the object distance plus 1 over the image distance is equal to 1 over the focal length of the lens. Now again, si sign conventions play a very important role in this business. Uh, P, which is the object distance, is always positive. Now whereas for mirrors where P defined the side where positive image distances were to be defined, rather for lenses we have uh, I greater than zero when it's on the opposite side from the object. So this is the key distinction between mirrors and lenses. For mirrors, images are real, that is, I is a positive number, when the image forms on the same side as the object. But for lenses, the image is real, that is, I is positive, when that image forms on the opposite side of the lens from where the object is located. So just to complete this, I less than zero you're on the same side as the object and this defines real I positive just like before and I negative defines virtual. Now for focal lengths F is greater than zero for a converging lens and that's because parallel rays focus on the side of the lens opposite the object. 
So you can kind of see a pattern here. Where the image forms uh, is positive when it's on the side opposite the object, the focal length of a lens is positive when it focuses parallel rays on the side opposite the object. F less than zero is a diverging lens. And that's because parallel rays focus on the same side as the object. So that's the thin lens equation, and this allows you to locate images given focal lengths or figure out the focal length of the lens given the, uh, uh, the image distance and the object distance. So this is the kind of thing you'll have to, to play around with. Now, of course, in addition, we have the concept of magnification again. And just like with mirrors, the absolute value of the magnification is equal to the height of the image divided by the height of the object. So this is the image height. This is the object height. And m is assigned quantity. And uh, again, we have a situation where the uh, the sign, you know, recalling again that the uh, real images for a converging lens formed on the opposite side of the lens and were inverted. So those eyes were positive, uh, but to get an inverted image, you have to have a negative number. So this is just the negative of the ratio of the image distance over the object distance. So this gives you both the magnification factor and a sign that re means uh, upright or inverted. So if m is greater than zero, we have an upright image. And if m is less than zero, we have an inverted image. That's all that sign means. Otherwise, you take the absolute value of m, and you get the magnification factor. Magnification factor. So it's the same game as with mirrors. m equals negative i over p, and the absolute value of m gives you the ratio of the heights of the image and the object. And putting all of this together, you can go back and think about that thin lens situation. So, so let's think about a thin converging lens. Here you have a focal length that's greater than 0. So f is a positive number. Uh, of course, we have that p is a positive number. And let's look at the lens equation for different situations. So the lens equation is 1 over p plus 1 over i equals 1 over f. Now, let's focus on images. So if p is greater than f, that is, if the object is located uh, very far from the focal point of the, the converging lens, uh, then we can figure out what the image is going to, to do. So we have 1 over i is equal to 1 over f minus 1 over p. Now let's put in some numbers. Let's say that the focal length of this lens is a convenient 1 meter. And let's put the object distance at a whopping 4 meters away from the lens. So that is 4 times the focal length. Now we can plug into the lens equation. We have 1 over i equals 1 over 1 meter minus 1 over 4 meters. So we have 1 minus 1 fourth, which is 3 fourths. So we have 1 over i equals 3 fourths inverse meters, or 1 over meters. So we can solve. i is equal to 4 thirds of a meter. So we see that we have a real image that forms, as we saw in the computer simulation. We have a real image that forms, and it forms at a distance of 4 thirds meters, uh, which is just slightly longer than 1 meter. So it forms uh, a little bit uh, close to the, closer to the lens than the object, but still further than the focal length on the other side. And we can also see that this is going to be an inverted image, because m equals negative i over p. And this is going to be negative uh, 4 thirds over 4, which is negative 1 third. 
So we wind up with a inverted, reduced image compared to the object. It's one-third the height of the object, that's the one-third, and it's a negative sign in front of that, so it's inverted. So we can play around with the equation and very quickly see what we saw in the computer simulation. If you put an object at a larger distance than the focal length, then you get an inverted, reduced image that's real. You can continue to play this game. So again, let's imagine that f is 1 meter and p is now 2 meters. So we have 1 over i equals 1 over 1 meter minus 1 over 2 meters and that leaves us with 1 over 2 meters or 1 half meters to the minus 1 so that i is equal to 2 meters. So we see here that again we get a real image and its magnification factor negative i over p is negative 2 meters over 2 meters is negative 1. So when you put an object at twice the focal length when p equals 2f something interesting occurs. You still get a real image it is inverted but it is unmagnified. It's the same height as the object. So that's a special case. When p is equal to 2f you wind up with a real inverted image whose height is exactly the same as the object. Now let's go inside the focal length. Let's put f equal to 1 meter and p equal to uh, 0 0.5 meters or 1 half of a meter. So now we have 1 over i equals 1 over 1 meter minus 1 over a half is 2 meters to the minus 1. So we wind up with 1 meter to the minus 1. 1 meter to the minus 1 minus 2 meters to the minus 1 is negative 1 meters to the minus 1. So i equals negative 1 meters. So here we have a virtual image because i is a negative number. We can look at the magnification factor. This is negative of negative 1 meter divided by uh, 1 half meter, which is equal to negative 2. Oh. Which is equal to positive 2. So here you get an enlarged upright image of the object that's virtual. So a virtual enlarged upright image. Its height is greater than that of the object by a factor of 2 and it's upright. We have a positive sign on the magnification and it's virtual because it forms on the same side of the lens as the object, that is uh, at a negative distance. So I hope that this gives you the groundwork for playing around with thin lenses